Hey friends, so um, I wanted to say a few thank yous. First of all, thank you to Alfred for uh, allowing me to even be a part of this at all. I'm so grateful. Uh, I also wanna say a big thank you to Felicia. If any of y'all had any idea how bad I am at technology and how much behind the scenes duct tape has been going on to, to make this viable where I can be with you, you'd be amazed. I'm so grateful, Felicia, for you for, for steering all this and for allowing me to be with my friends. And friends, I wanna say thank you to you. It's the morning, it's the summer, it's a Saturday and you're here with me. So I don't take that lightly, I'm grateful. I thank you so much for being here. So let's start our opening uh, time together with a, a concert opener. This is Music Gives and the text is attributed to Plato. There's, we're not sure if he actually said this or not, but that music gives. And what does it give? It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and a life to everything. Essentially, music gives. And those of us who have spent our lives making music understand that gift very well and what a gift music has been for us, and that once we've received this beautiful gift, that we have a, an obligation and even an honor to get that, to share that gift with others. And so I was excited to get to write this as a concert opener. I wanted it to kind of have that anticipation feel like when you first sit down in a movie theater and you got your popcorn and your soda and you're ready to go. So this piece is um, set in that great movie mode of Lydian. There's a lot of Lydian in this. So I hope you enjoy our opener, Music Gives. Oh. 
So that's our opener. Um, I'm from the 70s and 80s. And as a grown up and singing in choirs, see if you had a similar experience. Uh, multicultural basically meant singing a mostly European concert and then tacking on a spiritual at the end, whether that's where it belonged in the narrative arc of a program or not. Um, and sometimes it was a little ego driven, I think, just so that it, to kind of guarantee a standing ovation at the end of a program. And um, so then in the early 90s, this song, this freedom song out of South Africa started to emerge and it became ubiquitous. And that song was Sia Hamba. And I still remember the first time I ever heard it. It, it was unlike anything I'd heard before. And there was repetition to it, but you know, it didn't feel repetitious. It, it, each time there was a new verse, it seemed to generate more energy and it just started to grow and to build. And of course that piece got programmed in so many different uh, places, I programmed it. And a, as we have continued to grow and broaden our idea of, of what multicultural really means and and opening ourselves to the possibilities. Uh, I'm so grateful for our friend, Victor Johnson, who has come back around to see a hum begin to, to remind all of us about what an important song that was and still is. And this is a, a great arrangement. It's got a wonderful piano part that really propels it forward, but still feels like it belongs to the piece. And there's also some percussion that goes along with it. And this is just a wonderful setting of see a humba. I love that one. I love Sia Hamba. And that's a, such a great, fresh arrangement. Okay, so this next song is one that uh, has a, a real place in my heart. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was contacted by Joe Lee, who's the artistic director of the Major Minors, which is a 
wonderful uh, course. It's part of the, the Pride community. They're just such a remarkable uh, group of young people. And Joe had said, would you be willing to write something that would kind of be our, our, our piece, our theme song? And I said, I'd love to. Um, is it okay if I visit with the members of the choir? He said, sure. So we hopped on on a Zoom, kind of like we're doing right now, and I got to visit with the members of the choir. And I asked them to tell me a little bit about, well, what, is, what do the major minors mean to you? Who are you? Tell me your story. And so they started telling me things about the choir itself. But what really touched me is when several of the young people started to stand and tell me their individual stories, started to tell me stories that were full of challenge and um, trepidation and heartbreak and beauty. And I was taking furious notes trying to keep up. And somewhere along the process, I went from being excited to have the commission to uh, feeling responsible because uh, those young people had let me into a circle of trust that I had not earned. I, had, I did not earn the right to be there. Uh, and to hear those amazing stories that they shared, but they shared them anyway. And so I was grateful for that. And so I really wanted to make sure that I wrote a piece that was more than just about acceptance or tolerance or even welcome, but really about openness and uh, celebrating and honoring and embracing. And um, preparing for being with you today, it reminded me of a poem, and I, I wasn't going to read this, but I think I will. It's by the... Uh, 14th century Persian uh, Sufi poet Hafiz. And here's, here's what Hafiz says. I wish that I could show you when you were lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your being. And of course, he says in four short lines what I can't say in an entire piece, but I did my best. So anyway, here is You Are Light.
So if anyone from major minors or directors or people who know them are with us today, just hi, I'm so proud of you. And I'm glad I got to do that with you. Uh, so our next song, not much introduction needed. It's Clever Chameleon. Any of you that, that you obviously know Alfred, so you know the name Andy Beck. And Andy can write about hope and light and beauty. And Andy knows how to have fun. And I don't say just for fun because fun is important. Sometimes we just need a release valve. We need to be able to smile. We need to be able to laugh. We need to be able to have a good time. And when Andy writes a light or a novelty piece, it's clever, it's fun, it's easy to learn, it's easy to memorize, it's fun to sing. So here is Clever Chameleon. So fun, right? And the percussion is a lot of fun with that too. I really like that novelty. Okay, so one of the things I get to do is work with young people, especially young children, and we talk about pride. And I share with the kids that pride is like cholesterol. There is a good kind and a bad kind. And um, so first, the bad kind. The bad kind of pride is when you're so full of yourself that you don't leave room for anyone else or their feelings. And uh, that's the bad kind of pride, but there's a good kind of pride too. And I always encourage young people that it's okay to be proud of yourself, to recognize that you're a person of worth, that you are one of a kind, that you matter, and that the world just wouldn't be the same without you. <clears throat> And, and I think we need to hear uh, that, that, that someone is proud of us and it's okay to have that kind of pride. So before I, I worked on this piece, I went to social media and I just wrote, it, I said, okay, friends, tell me, when did you, was a time in your life when you most needed to hear the words, I'm proud of you? And most of the responses were something like, well, when we tried and it didn't work out, like when we tried out for a solo or we lost the game or we tried to get the grade or the promotion and it just didn't work out. 
how much it would have meant to hear someone who cared about us look us in the eye and say, hey, I'm proud of you. And so that's the energy behind this song that you'll hear in a minute. And at the very end, it's kind of open-ended. There's It's unaccompanied at the end but with the, the voice singing, are you proud of me? And what my hope is with this song is it generates conversation with hopefully if parents come to hear the program at night, then on a lot of car rides home from a concert, parents are looking their kids right in the eye and saying, you know, I'm proud of you. And that's my hope anyway. So here is, are you proud of me? Okay, so I have a question for you. Does anybody here remember the George Winston album, December? It's one of my all-time favorite albums. And uh, I love it because it's the place where joy and melancholy intersect. And uh, I live at that intersection, by the way. So if you're ever driving down joy or melancholy and you get to that intersection, just wave. I'll be the one laughing or crying, depends on the day. And uh, that's the way I feel about December. It's this time uh, of hope, but also of remembering of joy and melancholy. And so as I was working on this December canon, I thought, all right, let me try it in minor. And that didn't work. And I'm like, okay, let me try it in major. And that didn't work. And then I tried it in Dorian. And well, let's find out. Here's December canon. Thank you. 
So next we have uh, an arrangement of Poor, Wear Poor Wayfaring Stranger by the great Mark Hayes. And this has a kind of soulful gospel feel to it. There's a lot of uh, call and response to this. So it's a, it's a explore some different kinds of musical ideas. And every once in a while, I'll ask myself the question, do we really need another so-and-so? And there are several settings from the past of Poor Wayfaring Stranger, but my answer is, do we need another one is yes. Um, we have a lot of responsibility as choral musicians to explore and celebrate the new, to find new composers, to uh, celebrate cultures that have not been celebrated before, uh, to, to sing musics of classical uh, folks of the past, and also to keep folk songs alive. Back in the day, it wouldn't have been written down on paper. It would have been song leaders and storytellers that would have passed those songs along from generation to generation, and always with their own little twist on it. And so, well, we're the, we're the song leaders and the storytellers of our cultures now, and we have kind of a responsibility to do all of that, which is a lot. Uh, but this is a very fresh, wonderful, insightful arrangement of Poor Wayfaring Stranger.
Okay, so a few minutes ago, I had asked if anybody remembered the George Winston album, December, which came out 40 something years ago. Now, if that question didn't date me, I bet this next one's gonna. Does anybody remember Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians? So growing up as a kid, we had a Christmas album of Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians. And the second half of the album was all these uh, like Jingle Bells, Rudolph, and the very last one was this fun, jazzy setting of Twas the Night Before Christmas. And so last week I was at TCDA and I heard uh, a reading of Andy's Twas the Night Before Christmas and it just took me back to this place when I was a little kid and I had the album cover which had a Norman Rockwell a uh, picture of Santa Claus peeking around a chair where a couple of boys were asleep trying to stay up. And it just took me back to that place. And I was just like, oh, this is just this. So this arrangement is just right. It's so much fun. And it's not, you, we're going to see the SATB, but it's also set for SAB and, so, and also for two-part voices, works for a lot of different groups. So here is a wonderful arrangement of Twas the Night Before Christmas. was the night before Christmas. When all through the house, not a creature was stirring. Not even a mouse. Twas the night before Christmas When all through the house Not a creature was stirring Not even a mouse The stockings were hung by the chimney with care Hoping St. Nick would soon be there All the kids were nestled Snug in their beds Wild visions of sugar plums Dancing their heads Mama in a kerchief And dad in his cap They just settled down for a long winter's nap Twas the night Twas the night The night before Christmas Such a clatter. Straight out of my bed to see what was the matter. A wind in the window, I feel like a flash. Opened all the shutters and opened the sash. When what to my wondering, I should appear. A miniature sleigh and a tiny reindeer. Twas the night, twas the night, the night before Christmas. So friends, thank you all so much for, for being with me th this morning and, and sharing time together. Our last song that we're gonna do is uh, May a Rainbow Run Beside You. And this is a combination of two Irish blessings. And one of the things I like to do uh, late in the rehearsal process, once the students know the piece pretty well, is to close the rehearsal by standing in a circle and having the students, the singers sing to each other and bless each other. And in a secular context, what I would tell young people is a, a blessing is when we wish or hope or pray good things for someone else. We wish them well, we want them well, we hope them uh, good things for them. And uh, so I love to do that where they can sing to each other. They sing to listeners so much, they sing to me a lot, but I love for them to get to sing 
to one another. And I would also encourage you to consider having this be the way you would close a program. So rather than simply finish with the, the big finale, go ahead and do that big song and then sing a blessing, bless the listeners uh, on their way or have the, the whole choir stand around the, the, the listeners if, if they're able to do that and, and sing this piece. And so that's how I'll close our time today by saying thank you and wishing blessings for you. So here is May a Rainbow Run Beside You. Friends, thank you once again. Big thank you to Alfred for having me. And uh, thank you to Felicia. Felicia, you're an absolute pro. I'm just trying to keep up. And to uh, those of you who joined us, thank you so much for sharing your time to, to be here with me. That, that It just means a lot to me and I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs>